Hello and welcome to this free preview lecture series of my P-Power exam preparation course. In this lecture, we are going to discuss grounding, which belongs to the first section, General Power Engineering, of the P-Power exam specification. And within General Power Engineering, it belongs to the subsection application. Now, if you are a practicing engineer who is uh, working for a consulting firm or as an owner's engineer, whether you are in transmission and distribution, whether you're working in a process plant, heavy industry, Grounding is one of those topics that you are bound to encounter in your career on a regular basis. And a sound understanding of grounding will help you design the power distribution properly, the systems properly, and it will also help improve the reliability of the overall network. And it is crucial to the proper implementation of protection scheme. But for some reason, every now and then I encounter power systems engineers who would have a so-so understanding of grounding. It is sort of an abstract concept and a lot of times our systems engineers get confused with the terminology and proper application of code. So therefore it's always a good idea to take a deep dive into grounding. As part of your P-Power exam preparation, look at this as an opportunity to learn the fundamentals of grounding and improve your overall understanding of grounding because it's not only going to help you with your exam preparation, but it is also a critical concept to understand and properly implement as a power systems engineer. And within my course, I have multiple lectures on grounding. In fact, I have some supplementary lectures for my students who are interested in learning above and beyond what is required for the P power exam preparation when it comes to grounding. Before we dive into the content, I would really appreciate if you could like this video, subscribe to the channel and click the bell icon if you haven't already done so. Hello and welcome to part one of our multi-part lecture series on the topic of grounding, which is a subtopic within applications. An application is a subsection of section one, general power engineering. Learning objectives of this lecture include introduction to grounding, benefits of proper system grounding, electrical safety, physiological effects of current, and we will also discuss body current limits. Grounding. Earlier in the course, I introduced the concept of grounding in the context of ground resistance testing. Grounding is further divided into equipment grounding or bonding, and the second category is system grounding. So let's start with equipment grounding. Equipment grounding is a connection of earth ground to non-current carrying conductive materials. For example, connection of ground to conduit, cable trays, junction boxes, enclosures, and motor frames. Equipment grounding limits and stabilizes voltage to ground on equipment. And this process of bonding creates a potential plane, which ensures that all metallic components remain at the same potential to ground. So this is a safety feature. We don't want the voltage on the enclosures to exceed. Okay. We want the voltage on the enclosure to basically stay the same so that when you contact, if you are accidentally making in touch with an enclosure, which is live, then you don't get electric shock. System grounding. System grounding is a connection of earth ground to neutral point of current carrying conductors. For example, connection of ground to neutral point of a circuit or a transformer would be considered system ground. Connection can be either solid or with a current limiting device, which will be discussed later on in the very last lecture of this multi-part lecture series on grounding. So we will discuss ungrounded systems, grounded systems, low resistance grounded, high resistance grounded, and so on. Benefits of proper system grounding. Now these details are not provided in NCS P power reference handbook, but as power systems engineer, in my opinion, you should have a good understanding of these benefits. Now we will go in detail of different um, grounding scheme in the very last lecture of this lecture series. And again, I will point out some of these benefits as we go from a solidly grounded system to a high resistance to a low resistance and so on. But a very, at a very high level, um, all properly grounded systems will be able to reduce magnitude of transient over voltages and it is best understood when you compare it with ungrounded systems. So I will explain this in the very last lecture of this lecture series. It simplifies ground fault location. And again, this is something that we will discuss in lecture number four of this multi-part lecture series. 
It improves system and equipment fall protection. It reduces maintenance time and expenses. Personnel safety. It is something that we will focus in this lecture and the next lecture. And it is an integral part of lightning protection as we have already seen. Electrical safety. Safety is a very broad topic. And in fact, electrical safety on its own is a very broad topic. So why is electrical safety important? Electrical safety is important because electricity is something that we use every day, yet it has a potential to severely injure or kill individuals instantly. Modern society is electrified like never before and that is part of the reason why sometimes we can become complacent because electricity is all around us. Hundreds of preventable electrical incidents happen each year, some of which result in death and many of these incidents could possibly be prevented if the individuals involved were more aware of electrical safety uh, considerations or if proper processes or procedures were in play. That's why electrical safety is of paramount importance, especially for people who are working in the industry. So another quick question for you, what is more dangerous, current or voltage? There is a common phrase in electrical safety that it is not the voltage that kills, it's the current. It's quite true because a current of few milliamps can cause painful shock, muscle clamping, and even ventricular fibrillation. For example, a hair dryer actually operates at 8 amps or 8,000 milliamps. A 100 watt light bulb carries 1 amp or 1,000 milliamp. A coffee maker carries 7 amps or 7,000 milliamps. So that is not to say that voltage is harmless. In fact, in the next lecture, we will look at step voltage and touch potential uh, or touch voltage and we'll discuss how electric shock can actually adversely impact and even injure and kill people, right? But at, at a very basic level, it's basically the current that ends up causing most of the damage. Before we jump into the different threshold values of current and what are its physiological effects on us, we have to recognize and appreciate that human body basically contains many biological voltage differences. Okay, the three broad ones or the three more important ones from electrical safety point of view are the ones that occur in the brain. So nerves carry electrical signals due to voltage differences, okay? And these are very minute voltage differences. And that basically helps coordination of um, all the activities that happen in the brain. So the brain basically sends out electrical signals to different parts of the body and within the brain, okay? So if those signals get impacted, then obviously the functioning of the brain can be compromised. Then you have muscles. So muscle movements are also dependent on voltage differences and probably the most important muscle in question is the heart. Then we have retina, which we know that whatever we see is actually in the form of electrical signals. So there are nerves at the back of our eye, okay? And they carry electrical signals to the brain and the brain actually interprets them in, uh, uh, you know, the brain actually inverts the image. What we actually see is an inverted image and the brain actually corrects it. So all of those are electrical signals. So you can see that our body contains millions and billions and trillions of um, electrical signals for proper functioning. Now, if those electrical signals get uh, impacted because of shocks of um, electrical current that passes through our body, then it can have adverse effects on, on our body. So what happens when electrical current passes through our body? There are different stages of uh, physiological effects and they basically depend on the amount of current that is passing through the body as well as the duration. So for us to even detect that current is passing through our body, it has to be at least one milliamps in magnitude, in, in uh, size and we have to be exposed to it for one to three seconds and the base case is a 70 kg human and the frequency I forgot to mention is 60 hertz. So 
if the current is less than 0 0.5 uh, sorry 1 milliamp and the duration is less than 1 to 3 seconds and the person is lighter than 70 kgs then the person may not even perceive that the that there is that the person is even exposed to the current so this is the threshold of perception now if the current is less than 6 milliamps then we'll be able to voluntarily let go of the current okay so we still have muscle control and we can actually open our arms or pull our body and uh, let go of the current as low as 20 milli uh, 22 milliamps can cause respiratory paralysis okay and this can result in death at, 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 at this stage ventricular fibrillation is when the heart actually um, the rhythm of the heart beating it actually um, goes out of sync and that is a very scary condition so that can happen between 75 to 400 milliamps and then you have sustained myocardial contraction so the heart you know is a muscle which contracts it beats by contracting okay it contracts and decontracts contacts and decontracts so this is forced contraction due to the current so this can happen between 1 amp to 6 amp again it is a it can lead to death by itself and then if the current is high enough then you would see burns okay these burns some of which will be actually visible uh, to us on outside the body and these burns can also take place within the body okay and which which can be more difficult to identify and there have been cases apparently when electricians have been exposed um, to current and although in the short term or the medium term it doesn't seem like anything happened right there might be some vis visible burns and the person might have just been able to you know continue with their even the, the, the activity that whatever he or she was up to but uh, there have been cases where doctors have basically found out later in in the age later on that um, there was tissue burn right and they could trace it back to that particular incident when the electrician or whoever was working on electrical equipment got exposed to it so this is very scary because although uh, right away it might seem that nothing happened but it can have adverse effect even later on in your life body current limits now in the last lecture slide we went over the different conditions that or experiences that the body goes through when current passes through it um, in terms of electrical safety ieee standard 80 2000 which is titled as guide for safety in ac substation grounding it actually lists permissible or list equation that can help us come up with permissible body current and it depends on the body weight and the duration of current exposure so this is the maximum current that can pass through individuals um, and this is sort of the upper tolerable limit and these equations have been built after quite a bit of research uh, experimentation on animals and uh, different considerations have gone into coming up with these equations so we won't go through the, them in detail but for our purposes and you don't need to memorize this equation these two equations they're provided in NCSP power reference handbook but the two important things to note over here are that the allowable current limit depends on the weight of the individual so they specify two weights 50 kg and 70 kg okay um, so the higher the weight uh, the more current can be allowed okay and the second element is current exposure duration which is time of exposure okay so you can see that for a 50 kg person the numerator is 0 0.116 now compare this to a 70 kg person where the numerator is higher it basically means that higher amount of current can pass through a person which ha uh, who has a higher weight and that has to do with the fact that a person with a higher weight will actually offer greater resistance to the current and um, and th again this is based on a number of experiments and um, a lot of research has gone into it so these equations will give you the upper limit of allowable current that uh, can be um, that can pass through a person and the person would um, not be severely injured 
Let us now go through a few practice problems in order to understand what it really means and what level of current we are talking about. So in this problem, we are given four different scenarios. We have a person weighing 50 kg who is exposed to current for one second. Um, then scenario B involves the same person being exposed for 0.1 second. The third scenario involves a 70 kg person being exposed to current for one second. And then the final scenario involves the 70 kg person being exposed for 0.1 second. And in each of these scenarios, we have to calculate the maximum permissible current or the upper limit for the body current that can pass through this person uh, or these people and um, without damaging them. So for the first scenario, we will use the formula for the 50 kg person. It contains 0.116 in the numerator and in the denominator we have square root of time. So time is one second. So the maximum allowable current that can pass through the individual for one second is 116 milliamps. Second scenario involves 0.1 second. So because the time duration is one tenth, you can see that a higher amount of current can potentially pass through the person without severely injuring them. Third scenario involves a 70 kg person. Now essentially this is a comparison between the two. You can see that for the similar conditions that is one second for 50 kg and one second for 70 kg, for a 70 kg person, 157 milliamps of current can pass as compared to 116 milliamps for the 50 kg. And similarly for scenario D, that's basically a comparison between the 50 kg and 70 kg for 0.1 second. And you can see that for the 70 kg person, 496 milliamps of current can pass through, whereas for the 50 kg person, 367 milliamps of current can pass through for 0.1 second. Now, if you were to put this in perspective, we are talking about quite a bit of current, okay? We are talking about hundreds of milliamps, but the underlying fact that you must understand over here is that this is a controlled condition, okay? That basically means that this amount of current will only pass for one second, okay? But over here, these are some of the other thresholds that we've discussed. So we'll start with the first one, which is threshold of perception for a 70 kg human being. So if a person is exposed to one milliamp of current for one to three seconds, he or she would basically be able to um, feel that current um, is, is passing, okay, uh, through the body or will get a tingling sensation. Now the let go current is only six milliamps, okay? So if the current is less than six milliamps or six milliamps, the person would be able to let go by using the muscular force, right? But over here, don't confuse it that 116 milliamp current can pass through a person, okay? And the person will basically be able to let go, okay, after one second or 0.1 second, because a lot of these bad things can potentially happen, right? Think of it as an experiment, 116 milliamps, where um, after one second, definitely that current is going to go away, okay, in a controlled setting, in an experimental setting, okay? But in reality, um, current over six milliamp is difficult to let go because um, you start losing control over your muscles, okay? And then at 22 milliamps, respiratory paralysis can happen, okay? and then uh, your heart can get out of sync in terms of its beating, right? Um, as low as 75 milliamps. So even the lowest current that we've calculated over here, which is uh, for a 50 kg person exposed for a duration of one second, it is a very large amount of current, okay? But the catch over here, or the concept or the assumption I should say over here, is that that person would all is being exposed for only one second. But as you can see over here, the let go current is only six milliamps, okay? So um, 116 milliamp current is a very large amount of current. So current, even in very, very small amount, can be very, very dangerous. In this lecture, we introduced 
equipment grounding and system grounding. Then we looked at benefits of proper system grounding. We dived into electrical safety. We looked at physiological effects of current. And then we established body current limits using IEEE standard 80 equations, which are dependent on the weight of the person and the duration of current exposure. For further practice, I would recommend you check out the quiz at the end of the lecture and also attempt the study guide for P power problem set on this topic. Thank you. If you found this preview lecture helpful, I'm confident that you will also benefit from the full course that contains more than 150 lectures and covers all the topics that are found in the latest NCES P power exam specification for the computer based testing format. You will also get access to tons of quizzes and mini exams in this course that will help you get additional practice along with a bonus full length computer simulated practice exam. This streamlined and well reviewed course comes with an amazing 30 day full refund policy, no questions asked. Once you enroll, I will schedule a one on one zoom call with you to develop a custom study plan based on your schedule and time constraints. On top of all of this, I have also included a special discount link in the text section of this video for you.